Check, check. Everybody can hear me okay? Okay. All right. Well, hopefully you grabbed a handout in the back as we plow ahead in our Sunday School series on the privileges of the Christian life. Um, maybe we'll have some more trickle in, but let's open with a word of prayer, shall we? Our Father in heaven, we thank you for the death and resurrection of Christ, our Savior. We thank you that we are united to him in that death and resurrection so that we can be assured by your spirit that all of your wrath has passed us by. Uh, Father, we thank you that, that what we receive in this life as we experience the fallenness of this world is, is safely in your fatherly hands to discipline us and to lead us onward in faith and in obedience to your word. Uh, Father, we pray that you would forgive us of all of our sins this morning and that you would refresh and remind us of the blessings that are ours in covenant with you. Would you bless us as we consider the material that is before us? Uh, would you enable us to apply this material in our lives this week as we lift our eyes to our Savior, in whose name we pray, amen. Okay, well, for the last two weeks, we've been looking at privileges of the Christian life, and we've started with some big ones. Uh, remember the first privilege, the mega privilege. Anybody remember what that was two weeks ago? Knowing God, knowing Him in fellowship, knowing Him in a reconciled relationship, delighting in God as our God, and having God delight in us as His people in an unbreakable bond of fellowship. Now, this is the greatest privilege of the Christian life. This is the the goal of the gospel. This is the end of all the means of grace that we enjoy as members of Christ's church. It is to know God, to grow, and to delight in fellowship with Him. And then together with that, what did we look at last week? Do you remember the privilege last week? Being the image of God. Very good. Uh, being the image of God relates to knowing God because... As the image of God, we are, we are made by God to know Him. <laughs> so the great privilege of the Christian life is not something that, that strips the gears of who we are. It's actually the, the fullest realization of what we're made for. Uh, we are God's image made to, to delight in Him in unbreakable fellowship. Uh, so, so knowing that we are the image of God, delighting as believers that we are the image of God, and then remember last week, being renewed in Christ in the ethical orientation of our heart, seeking more to, to know and love God as opposed to ignore, suppress the truth in, an, in unrighteousness and, and operate out of a spirit of hostility toward God. That is a privilege of the Christian life. What I want to talk with you about today is something that integrates and connects knowing God and being the image of God. So what we're going to look at today is, is something that embraces both privileges that we've looked at two weeks ago and last week. And I have to warn you, we have about 40 minutes to tackle a massive biblical topic. <laughs> and it's going to require a little bit of, of thinking and attention to really understand this this piece, but I trust we can do it. It is, as you see on your handout, the privilege of God's covenant. The privilege of God's covenant. Now, to speak of the covenant or the covenant idea in the Bible is really to have to speak of the two major covenants in Bible history. Let me just write these on the board for us. Probably familiar to you. The covenant of works and the covenant of grace. So the covenant of works and the covenant of grace. When I speak of the covenant as a Christian privilege, what I mainly have in view is the covenant of grace. 
being a member of, being a participant of, being a beneficiary of the covenant of grace. But before we get to the covenant of grace, we have to understand the covenant that comes temporally and logically before the covenant of grace, namely the covenant of works. This is the backdrop to the privilege of participating in this. So we have to know both. Uh, but but bef before we know this, we have to know something about the covenant idea in general. What is a biblical covenant? How does it function? What is its purpose? And for this, I want to draw your attention back to the Westminster Confession of Faith, chapter 7, section 1. We looked at this in our opening week. I'll read it for you again. The distance between God and the creature is so great that although reasonable creatures do owe obedience unto him as their creator, yet they could never have any fruition of him as their blessedness and reward, but by some voluntary condescension on God's part, which he hath been pleased to express by way of covenant. Okay, brief review here. And you can just nod your head or shout out with joy, uh, whatever you like. The distance between God and the creature. Is this a physical or spatial distance between God and the creature? Anybody want to give it a shot? I saw a slight, slight, no. Okay, we got more no's coming. Very good. This is not a physical or spatial distance between God and the creature. Why? God everywhere. is everywhere. God, to use the children's catechism, I love this answer. God has not a body like man. God is a spirit. He isn't confined, nor does he dwell within time and space. Time and space are created things. Now God is uncreated. He is the true and living God. So what is this distance? Well, we said two weeks ago, it's a distance in being. God is God. We are his finite, dependent creatures. And entailed in this relationship between the creator and the creature is the inescapable fact that we as God's creature, made in his image, owe him obedience and worship and praise. And again, this isn't a bad thing. This is what we're made for. This is what we're made to do. But notice the confession goes on to say, that though we owe obedience unto God simply by virtue of our existence, we could not have any fruition of him, any, any blessing from him, any blessing of him, except by some voluntary condescension on God's part. Uh, that is to say, over and beyond the obedience we owe to God, God has chosen to offer himself to us, as the confession says, as our blessedness and our reward. And we looked at what it meant to have God as our blessedness. This is what it means to dwell in an unbreakable bond of fellowship with God. It means to delight in God, to know him in a bond of fellowship in which he delights in us as his people, giving himself to us that all that he is is for us, for our benefit. And all that we are is offered to him in a sacrifice of praise. But the text goes on to say, God offers himself to us by voluntary condescension, stooping to our level. He offers himself to us as our reward. Now that's an interesting word. How is it that God offers himself to us as our reward? Well, to understand this, and to understand what it means to have God as our blessedness, uh, we have to understand uh, biblical covenants. Because for God to be our reward invokes the idea of covenant. As the confession says, he has been pleased to express this by way of covenant. To have God as our reward means to have God as our covenantal reward. It's a reward given within the framework of a covenant. It's not a reward that we, strictly speaking, deserve, but it is a reward that comes to us through the mechanism, through the means of a covenant. So, just backing up for a moment, to think of a biblical covenant, we have to think of it 
as the way we can know God as our blessedness and reward. Covenant is that which God gives to us as his image so that what we're made for as his image can be realized. And this, we're going to see, is a great privilege. We can actually have the aspirations of our soul satisfied. Uh, all of the dissatisfaction we experience in this world can actually be overcome as we experience total satisfaction ultimately on the last day in God as our blessedness and reward because he's given us his covenant. Okay, that's where we're headed here. Notice Luke 17, 9 and 10. These are Jesus' words. Uh, this is a wonderful text just to drive home the natural obligation that is ours as his creature. Will any one of you who has a servant plowing or keeping sheep say to him when he has come in from the field, come at once and recline at table? Does he thank the servant because he did what he was commanded? So you also, when you have done all that you were commanded, say, we are unworthy servants. We have only done what was our duty. Okay, taking that last phrase there and thinking back to the Garden of Eden, when God created Adam as his image, dependent upon him for life and breath and everything, when God placed him in the garden, Adam was naturally obligated to, to obey God, uh, to honor the word of God, right? He was God's servant and son, but he was naturally obligated to obey God. But out of his goodness... God covenanted with Adam. God offered himself as Adam's blessedness and reward. God said, I gave you all this that is very good. But Adam, I will give you more in covenant with you. And God promised Adam that Adam would receive more than all that he was enjoying even in the pre-fall sinless paradise of Eden. He would have enjoyed a higher mode of life with God. He would, have, he would have transitioned into an unbreakable bond of fellowship with God. Because you know, as it happens, Adam was created in a bond of fellowship with God, but it was breakable, right? Uh, we know that because it broke. Uh, death was possible. Uh, losing out on the higher mode of life and blessedness was possible and actually came to pass. As we're going to see, though, in the wake of Adam's sin, in spite of the fact that we don't deserve the blessing and reward of the covenant, God secures that for us in and through the person of Jesus so that having God as our blessedness and reward actually comes to pass for you and for me in Christ. And so I put there Revelation 21, wonderful description. Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them and they will be his people. And God himself will be with them as their God. Okay. Covenant is the way that God provides for us to realize and enjoy that for which we were made. Okay, we're going to move into covenant of works, covenant of grace, but before we do that, let's look at a definition and key features of the covenant. We need, we need a definition of covenant that is flexible enough to cover both of these major covenants in the Bible. And these covenants function slightly differently in offering God to us as our blessedness and reward. So how are we going to define a covenant? Well, I've, I've labeled, uh, I've given you a number of definitions there. Hopefully it's not overkill. Heinrich Bullinger, a pact, an agreement, and promise. Okay. Thomas Brooks, a mutual agreement between parties upon articles or propositions on both sides so that each party is tied and bound to perform his own conditions. It's kind of a white lab coat way of going about it. Here's, uh, here's Francis Turretin. Uh, Francis Turretin, by the way, seminarians either love or hate Francis Turretin because he makes so many distinctions 
He makes distinctions you never knew existed. He makes distinctions within distinctions within distinctions. This is how he describes the covenant. Strictly and properly, covenant denotes the agreement of God with man by which God promises his goods and especially eternal life to him. And by man, in turn, duty and worship are engaged, certain external signs being employed for the sake of confirmation. And if you're at the early service, you just enjoyed one of these confirming signs uh, in the Lord's Supper. Meredith Klein, uh, this is helpful. A relationship under sanctions. Uh, a covenant is a kind of relationship, uh, but it's got a discernible structure and purpose to it. Ligon Duncan says it's a binding mutual relationship with attending obligations. And then this, for what it's worth, I put my own summary at the top, a divinely established solemn bond with mutual obligations and attending sanctions. Uh, we're going to talk about what sanctions are. Uh, but let's move on uh, and do that within a discussion of the key features of a biblical covenant. Okay, and I'm going to write these features down on the side of the board here. Um, you have two or more parties in a covenant. Two sides. In these major biblical covenants, the sides are going to be God and man in one way or another. You have a condition. Requirements. Obligation. You have a threat if the condition is not fulfilled, if one or both sides do not meet their obligations, you have a promise, which is just the flip side of the threat, if you do meet the conditions, if your obligations are met, and then you have sanctions. And by sanctions, I mean, I'll just put that here, blessing. What's the other side of blessing? Blessing cursing and there are always two sanctions to a covenant two sides okay you have parties two or more a condition threat promise and sanctions all right let's see how each of these play out in the two major covenants of bible history okay we got to put our thinking caps on and then we'll We'll transition through this material to see how participating in this is a great Christian privilege. The first major covenant God makes with human beings takes place in the Garden of Eden uh, before the fall. The Confession, section 2 of chapter 7, says this, The first covenant made with man was a covenant of works, wherein life was promised to Adam and in him to his posterity upon condition of perfect and personal obedience. It's a great description, very helpful to understanding the covenant of works. Let's try to work through the parts of the covenant and fill it out a little bit more. Okay, we've got to think very clearly. Who are the parties in the covenant of works? Anybody want to give it a shot? God and Adam, very good. Anybody want to tweak this at all? Is there anything else we can say based on Confession 7-2? Okay. God and Adam and the human race, we could say in Adam. And what we're talking about here is the fact that Adam was our covenant head. He is our covenant representative. All of us are bound up in the actions of Adam. Okay? And, uh, and many people will say three little words to that. Words that my children have often said. That's not fair. Right? There are a number of things we can say to the that's not fair objection. Let me just say two. Number one, God is God. It's always a good biblical answer. Uh, God has the right to order his voluntary affairs with the human race as he pleases. Now the question 
that might come is how is God just and fair in relating to human beings by way of a covenant representative? Well, to answer that question would probably take us a little bit more far, farther afield, but the nature of covenant union is such that what the action of one does, he does for those whom he represents because of our covenant union with him. Um, the second thing I'll say, and maybe this is a little bit more efficient, the same kind of covenant union that is at work in the covenant of works with Adam is the very same covenant union that is at work in our fellowship with Christ as our covenant head. So if you reject the notion of covenant union or covenant representation in the garden, then logically we must reject it in the covenant of grace as well. Just because it works to our detriment here and our benefit here doesn't mean we have license to be inconsistent. <laughs> so, covenant union in Adam. Okay, let's keep going. What's the condition of the covenant of works according to Westminster 7.2? Anybody want to give it a shot? What is the condition that is laid down for Adam to experience the covenantal reward? Perfect. Personal. Exact. And entire obedience. Never faltering. Never having a false thought. Never having a false motive. Obedience to the word of God from the heart. What is the threat? Should he fail to meet the condition of the covenant, which he naturally owes to God anyway? What's the threat? Death. Threat is death. What is the promise if he actually fulfills this condition? Life. We'll put life in big capital. Life. Not just physical life, right? But unbreakable bond of fellowship with God life. Greater life than he was experiencing even in sinless paradise of Eden. And then the sanctions are the blessing and the cursing. The blessing of life itself and the curse of not just physical death, but spiritual death. Uh, being cast outside the presence of God's favor forever. That was the structure of the covenant of work. We see a hint of it here in Genesis 2. The Lord God commanded the man, saying, You may surely eat of the tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. Okay, we see at least the focus of the condition. Obey me in everything, but especially with respect to this tree. Adam's global obligation is getting focused right here with the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Will he listen to the word of God? Will he interpret that tree under the light of God's word? Or will Adam say, I'm going to do things my way. I'm going to interpret the world and my experience according to my own devices. I'm going to ignore and reject the word of God and live in God's world as I see fit. That was the crisis of his test. Death clearly displayed as the consequence of his disobedience and implied in the threat of death, we can say, is the promise of life. Not only implied in the threat of death, but we see something else in the garden that I didn't put on your handout where life was actually promised to Adam if he would fulfill it. And we see that in the tree of life in the middle of the garden, right? Remember at the end of Genesis 3, after Adam and Eve have rebelled, God says, lest he reach out and take hold of the tree of life and live forever. And God thrust Adam and Eve out of the Garden of Eden. It seems that the tree of life was, was the means by which they would have been confirmed in upright holiness and righteousness and fellowship with God had they obeyed. And now that they have sinned and rebelled against God, they have no right to that sacrament in the garden. 
So they are thrust out, and what does God do? He places a cherubim with a flaming sword passing in every direction to guard the way to the tree of life. And the implication there, it seems, is that any son or daughter of Adam that would attempt to enter into the presence of God and take hold of the tree of life must pass under the flaming sword of God's judgment. You can't get to the tree of life on your own because it's guarded by the flaming sword of God's judgment. Okay, Adam and Eve disobey. They break the covenant of works. The threat of death is leveled upon them, and yet God in his mercy does not level the full threat of death. Life is going to be beset with death. Thorns and thistles are going to grow. Uh, childbirth will be hard, but life is going to continue. Uh, Adam and Eve will have children. Uh, Adam will get to work the ground. Uh, Eve will bear offspring, but it's going to be with the stamp of fallenness and sin on the earth. And God does not level the full penalty of death when they rebel because God in his mercy seeks to establish another covenant. Okay, I want you to think about Adam in the garden and there's a door in front of him and on that door is emblazoned the words eternal life by perfect obedience. Eternal life by perfect obedience. When Adam sins against God, that door is shut and locked forever. The door to eternal life with God by way of the covenant of works is forever closed after Adam sins. But God in his mercy provides another door to the same goal. And that door has emblazoned on it eternal life by the perfect, personal, exact, and entire obedience of Jesus Christ. And opening that door takes you to the same place that Adam's original door went to, even though that door is forever locked. God inaugurates another covenant whereby the same promise of life would be bestowed upon his people. Let's look at how the confession puts it in 7.3. Man by his fall, having made himself incapable of life by that covenant, you can hear the lock on the door slamming shut. The Lord was pleased to make a second, commonly called the covenant of grace, wherein he freely offereth unto sinners life and salvation by Jesus Christ, requiring of them faith in him that they may be saved and promising to give unto all those that are ordained unto eternal life his Holy Spirit to make them willing and able to believe. Okay, very briefly, who are the parties in the covenant of grace? You've got to really think about this. Who are the parties in the covenant of grace? We'll say God... We'll say God and I'll say his people in Christ. Covenant of works was with Adam and the human race in Adam. Covenant of grace is with God and his people in Christ. It's going to contain an offer that goes to the whole world, but it's going to be effectual only for those whom God decides. Okay, here's a real, this is probably the toughest question of the morning. What is the condition of the covenant of grace? What is the condition of the covenant of grace? Okay, I'm hearing faith and perfect obedience. This is something we have to get right. Well, the answer to that is both of those in a sense. The condition for us to participate in the covenant of grace, very simple, it's faith. 
And yet, no sooner do we say that faith is the condition than we have to qualify this. Faith is not a work. It's not the basis upon which we will receive the blessing. Faith is the instrument. Faith is the means by which we lay hold of Christ and in Christ all of the blessings of the covenant. So there's not a perfect parallel between faith and the obedience of Adam. It's not as though God says, well, you're supposed to obey, but if you just do this one work, I'll give you the blessing. No, no, faith occupies a totally different role here. It is the means by which we lay hold of Christ and the obedience of Christ is ultimately the condition by which we receive the blessings of the covenant. So from, from one angle, we can say there is no condition in the covenant of grace because Jesus Christ has fulfilled every condition by his perfect, personal, exact, and entire obedience, right? So we say, come, buy wine and milk, without money and without price, Isaiah 55, 1. Uh, salvation is by grace, free grace. But the way in which we receive the free grace of God is by faith, through faith. And notice what 7, 3 says. God himself gives you the faith that you need. It's not even something that you have to conjure up on your own. Faith itself is a gift of God uh, from the Holy Spirit. The threat, yes, there is a threat of death even in the covenant of grace. Not that those who are in Christ can ever perish. But if we had more time, we would say the covenant of grace brings someone into a visible community where people profess faith in Christ. Um, but the Bible also talks about those who profess faith without actually possessing faith. And for those who profess faith without actually possessing faith will receive the curse of the covenant of grace. What is the promise? It is, notice it says life and salvation. Very good, Arnie. Life and salvation. This is a wonderful, instructive thing. When Jesus fulfills the perfect, personal, entire, and exact obedience required of us, when he gives the fruits of his obedience to us through faith, not only do we receive the life that Adam could have enjoyed, but Christ also redeems us out of the penalty of everything that Adam's sin plunged us into. This is what the gospel is, friends. It's that Jesus, by his life, death, and resurrection, not only gets you out of the penalty of guilt and corruption that Adam's sin has plunged you into, he not only fixes the problem of Adam's breaking of the covenant of works, at the same time, he gives you the life, the unbreakable fellowship with God that Adam could have earned had he obeyed. That is why the confession says life and salvation. He not only fixes the problem, he gives us the positive blessing that Adam could have earned. And Jesus does this because in his perfect, entire, and exact obedience, Jesus not only obeys the law positively, he also suffers the penalty for our having broken the law. And that's something that Adam did not have to do. Adam only had to positively obey the law. Jesus had to positively obey the law and suffer the penalty for our having broken the law. And in doing both of those things, 
he redeems us out of the pit and gives us eternal life. Okay. Let me back up just for a second for two minutes before we go to the Christian privileges. When I talked about the covenant of works and Genesis 2 and God promising death should Adam disobey, there are some who say, well, that's not exactly a covenant. Mainly because Genesis 1 and 2 doesn't contain the word covenant anywhere. So this is like a, this is like a framework of Reformed theologians who love to just impose their theology on the Bible. I've got three answers to that. <laughs> is, is the original arrangement with Adam a covenant? Well, first, my answer is, if it walks like a covenant <laughs> and it talks like a covenant, it is a covenant. There is two or more parties, there's a condition, there's a threat, an implied promise, and clear sanctions. So that alone, I would argue, satisfies the requirement for there being a covenant in the Garden of Eden. Number two, the Bible sometimes doesn't use a word where the concept is present. Even where later scripture will say there's a covenant when in certain places in the Bible it doesn't use the word. So let me give you an example. When God covenants with David as one of sort of the, the dimensions of the unfolding of the covenant of grace, it never uses the word covenant. But the Psalms that refer back to God's covenant with David call it a covenant. So just because the word isn't there doesn't mean the concept isn't there. My third answer is that when you understand the person and work of Christ, you see how much the Bible presents the work of Christ as a new and second Adam, as a second covenant representative and clearly pu puts the work of Jesus in a covenantal context, which then tells us that the original arrangement with Adam was also a covenant. Just a couple of texts in your handout here. For as by a man came death, by a man has come also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, that is the whole human race, so also in Christ shall all be made alive, but each in his own order. Christ, the first fruits, then at his coming, and this is why I said his people, those who belong to Christ. Or uh, Romans 5. Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man, and death through sin, and so death spread to all men, because all sinned. By the way, Romans 5.12 is a huge verse for studying our responsible and just transgression in Adam as our covenant representative because Romans 5.12 is saying when Adam sinned, we sinned. Death spread to all men because all sinned. So one act of righteousness leads to justification and life for all men. Of course, not all people comprehensively, but all of God's people in Christ. And then how do we know that the same life offered to Adam is secured for us in Christ? Well, we talked about the tree of life in the garden. One of the most fascinating things, I think, one of the most exciting things in the Bible is that when we turn to the end of our Bible in Revelation 3, when the risen Christ is speaking to the church, Jesus says to the one who conquers, I will grant to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. Genesis 3, the flaming sword turning every way, guarding the way to the tree of life, communicating that every son or daughter of Adam that tries to enter into the presence of God and take hold of the tree of life will suffer the consequences of God's judgment. But friends, what Revelation is saying is that there is one who is actually passed under the flaming sword of God's judgment. And he has opened the way to the tree of life for you and me. He has opened the way for us to enter back in and not just experience the paradise of Eden, but to know something better than Eden, to know the blessing of the tree of life, of knowing God in an unbreakable bond of fellowship.
So how is the covenant of grace a Christian privilege? We've covered so much. And by the way, before I get to these, so much of this is just putting a framework on things you already know. I mean, th thinking about Christian assurance and the Lord's Supper and the work of Christ and the, and the pattern of God's dealings with Adam and Jesus for us, we're just putting explicit covenantal terminology on all of these things that you're likely very familiar with. But how is participating in the covenant of grace by being united to Christ a Christian privilege? Well, first, we say here, God has made a way beyond anything we could naturally concoct on our own by which we can know God as our blessedness and reward. I think it's just worth meditating on that for a second that God has provided a way for our heart to be satisfied. When we experience a world where so many people are running after things that they think will satisfy them, when, when you and I do that all the time, and we're grasping and seeking to gain things in this life that we think if we just have this thing, we'll be satisfied. And every time it seems to fall through our fingers, God has actually made a way for our heart to be satisfied. He's made us as his image, and he's made a way for us to be satisfied as his image. And that's a great thing. But in the wake of Adam's sin, we deserve nothing but God's judgment. We deserve to have our heart not only dissatisfied, but eternally punished for our sin. And so, number two, in the wake of our sin, in spite of our deserving the covenant curse, God has provided the one who has satisfied the necessary condition and won the covenant blessing, which he turns to share with us as his people. That is the gospel, that Jesus Christ has satisfied the covenant demands of God, and he offers to share his eternal reward with the likes of you and me. I say here from Hebrews 9, Christ is the mediator of a new covenant so that those who are called may receive the promised inheritance. 722, this makes Jesus the guarantor of a better covenant. Um, I've, I'm learning out of space here. But the word for guarantor in our ESV is sometimes translated surety. And here's your theological word for the day. Jesus is your surety if you know him by faith. What is a surety? A surety is one who makes himself personally responsible for fulfilling the obligations of another. I have a, a friend of mine who grew up in uh, blue-collar country in Pennsylvania, in Wilkes-Barre, Pennsylvania. He didn't grow up with a lot. When he was getting his first car, he remembered being faced with um, the cost of the car, and the bank loan, and to his great surprise, his father co-signed his name on the bank loan, guaranteeing that whatever penalty might devolve upon my friend would actually fall upon him. He was offering to be his son's surety for the car payment. Jesus Christ is our covenantal surety, and he has fulfilled every demand of the covenant already. And he offers the blessing of that obedience to you and me. Praise God that we have a covenantal surety. And then finally, God welcomes us into the visible community of the covenant of grace in which all the means of grace, teaching, preaching, prayer, sacraments, fellowship, are building us up to make our membership in the covenant more and more of a joy, more and more natural, more and more good uh, for us. Well, let me close with this. and I'm sorry I'm taking this over. This wonderful song by the English 18th century hymn writer, "'Tis mine, the covenant of his grace, and every promise mine, all sprung from everlasting love and sealed by blood divine. 
our surety. On my unworthy favored head, its blessings all unite, blessings more numerous than the stars, more lasting and more bright. Okay, I'm looking at that clock. I wish I could take questions. I know there must be some questions rumbling around in your brain. If you could catch me at another time or email me if I've been unclear or you have questions or comments about any of this material, please send them my way. Let me pray for us before we go. Father, thank you for the surety of the covenant, even the Lord Jesus Christ. Help us to live in light of his final and ultimate victory for us today. And help us to be satisfied in you alone. In Jesus' name, amen. Friends, if you have been to worship and you're done with no children to pick up, would you please exit these doors? If you have children, you can go out those doors and kind of go that way and, and head on to worship.